We are here at a warehouse in Porterville, California. That is David Blaine, hanging from a cluster of very colorful balloons. David Blaine. Yes, that David Blaine. Parts will jump out of the bed. Oh wait, and it landed under your watch. <laughs> <laughs> He's up to something new and unusual. Just to go back on everything, this idea has been a dream forever since I was, well, I think it's kind of universal, like, but in the last year I took it very seriously. David invited me behind the scenes to witness the extensive testing for his newest stunt. He's attempting to go as high as possible in the atmosphere, carried by a cluster of colorful weather balloons. So I had to get a hot air balloon pilot license, I got my gas restriction lifted, and then I had to become very confident and comfortable in the air. So I had to get hundreds of skydives in really fast, which has all been an incredible journey. Do you um, feel like you're experienced now? You've had enough jumps to no, be- No, of course not. When I first spoke to David, his goal was to go up in the atmosphere as high as possible and then skydive back down. So let's talk about altitude. His realistic goal is 15 to 20,000 feet in the atmosphere, which is the height at which skydiving planes start to require supplemental oxygen. But a stretch goal was the dream of 25,000 feet. But I've also been doing altitudes of up to almost 25,000 feet, mm -hmm. and I've been testing it without oxygen, which according to everybody, that's the death zone. When you go to 26,000 mm -hmm. above, you can't mm -hmm. survive there, but I don't believe that. And the reason I don't believe that is because Sherpas are up at the top of Mount Everest with nothing and that's and they're always okay that's 29,000 feet exactly which is 3,000 feet above the beginning the of the death right. zone the death zone seems like a good place to start our investigation the quote death zone is 26,000 feet above sea level and is widely considered the level above which there isn't enough oxygen for humans to survive for reference the top of Mount Everest is 3,000 feet above that while it's impressive even if David makes it to 15,000 feet and skydives back down which is the ultimate plan what it looks like they just tested was David putting on his parachute because he won't be wearing it as he's ascending, which is crazy. I was curious what this stunt will do to the human body and what he will need to do to survive. And then beyond that, I wondered what would happen if someone took this cluster of balloons above the death zone and whether that's even possible in a cluster of balloons. So let's take a look. It's interesting because as the balloons get higher, yeah. the helium expands because you get less and less pressure. If Bert's calculations are right, the balloon's gonna grow by two feet. So instead of eight foot, it should be 10 feet. I mean, that's something I was really curious about because I know as you go up, gas expands. Yep. Gas expands as you go up in the atmosphere because the pressure drops. We know this well now, but one of the first documented cases investigating this was two crazy Victorian explorers in 1862 who took a hot air balloon up to 37,000 feet. One of them passed out and they barely made it back alive. But as they were ascending, they were dropping birds out of the plane, and then they threw a third bird out at between four and five miles, which is 20 to 25,000 feet, and quote, it fell downwards as a stone. So at lower pressure, air becomes thinner. I want to show you an experiment to talk about the fact that the air gets thinner. Okay. Okay. Amazing. Yeah, so they expand so, cool. so much because the pressure is no longer pushing the balloons back in. So as you climb up the atmosphere, say you reach 9,000 feet or 2,700 meters, you might start to experience a persistent mystery cough. At 9,000 feet, the pressure is just 27% lower than sea level, but you might already experience swelling of the lungs due to blood vessels constricting in a condition called high altitude pulmonary edema, or HAPE, which can cause the unexplained coughing. And as for the balloons going up, what happens to them? So today's test is interesting. We've flown this up to eight or 9,000 feet, and it looks identical at eight or 9,000 feet. This is a sandbag meant to match David's exact weight, so they're using this as a stand-in for his weight for now. You know those like candies, nerds? Looks like a little cluster of nerds got stuck together. But today we're gonna get up into the 20s, right? And that's where we should see a significant difference in balloon size. One of the biggest worries with a drop in pressure though is the bends. There are gases dissolved in your blood. And Henry's law tells us that as the pressure on a liquid significantly drops, it can hold less dissolved gas, so the gases start to bubble out. This is known as decompression sickness, and scuba divers are very aware of it. The first documented case of decompression sickness, though, was with a coal miner in 1841 who described muscle cramps and pain. Mine shafts were pressurized to keep water out, which meant that more gas could dissolve in your blood while you're working 
working there. So it's quite unlikely David will have to worry about the bends at the heights he'll reach. So here's another question. Why don't we experience decompression sickness on planes that go up to 38,000 feet? Well, cabins are pressurized to about 8,000 feet, and it's not just for comfort. As you continue to ascend, say you get to 15,000 feet, your heart will start to beat faster and faster to get more oxygen to your brain because there's less oxygen in that thinner air. You start to feel tired, like you can't catch your breath because your body is responding to getting less oxygen with each breath. To combat the lack of oxygen, David will be turning to his breathing techniques. I started using my breathing technique where I was basically slow breathing and purging slightly. And what does what purging mean? Purging is Similar to so hyperventilating, like, where you're basically uh, getting rid of the CO2 to make more room for oxygen. Gosh, that doesn't make you lightheaded? I've done probably over a thousand breath holds at 10 minutes apiece. So I should have I should have clarified what I meant. It doesn't make you lightheaded. I mean, like I'm the average so human. It. Yeah, it's not good, and nobody <laughs> should do that. But, right, right, right. But I'm, I'm, I'm pretty used to it. It's just a technique, so and what you're doing is you're building yeah. a resistance to CO2 buildup in the bloodstream. I see. It's I really see. about a tolerance level. Gotcha. The oxygen level in your blood is very important for your brain. At 15,000 feet, Feet, some people experience impaired cognitive function, which means that if you have trouble remembering someone's name when you meet them now, it would be impossible with this low brain oxygen condition called hypoxia. Speed dating would be out of the question because you lose attentiveness, although poor judgment is also a factor, so maybe you would just pick the first candidate. So David will need all of his cognitive function because he'll be putting his parachute on in the air. So Reaching. I started the purging technique at about mm -hmm. 15,000 feet. Mm -hmm. My pulse oximeter jumped up to 99% right away, mm -hmm. and Luke's was slowly dropping. As we got to about 18, 19,000, his was dropping to about 80, and mine was still at 99. So he gotcha. said, that's not real. And I said, okay, let's switch. So I switched oximeters mm. for his, and mine A was immediately control. up to 99, and yeah. his was right back down to 70-something. With lower pressure and thinner atmosphere often comes lower temperatures. That's not always the case because the atmosphere protects us from powerful solar radiation. But generally, when gases expand, they get colder. We saw this happen when David's crew blew up the helium balloons. So they're filling up a bunch of balloons right now, which means I get to use my thermal camera to watch the balloons fill up and see how cold they get. So will David have to worry about the temperature as he ascends? So you lose about three and a half, a little less degree, about three and a half degrees Fahrenheit every yeah. thousand feet. So if we go up to 20,000 feet, for example, that would be minus 66. So we'd be right, at 33, right. which is, yeah. that's just normal freezing. So that's not a concern. Okay, now, and you're not we gonna were, be there for very long. No, but the way I had originally thought about this is that if I was gonna do it somewhere else in a different time of the year, it would, I was assuming it would go down to minus 20. So yeah, this yeah. is a blessing. If David continued up, he would have to worry about temperatures though. At 40,000 feet, which is about the height of a commercial airliner, the temperature drops to about minus 56 Celsius, which would give you frostbite within five minutes with any amount of wind. Although the temperature climbs back up to a balmy minus two at 160,000 feet. But at that point, the balloons would have definitely popped. Plus there's no chance of breathing up there. You'd have to take a thousand breaths to get as much oxygen as you would from one sea level breath. Interestingly, if you went up to 2 million feet, the atmosphere is pretty much all helium anyways, although there's effectively no atmosphere at that height. I think it's safe to say though that no one is getting up to 2 million feet in a cluster of balloons. Besides the discussion of what happens to your body, there were so many interesting engineering challenges that went into this stunt. I'm gonna really quickly list my favorites. In addition to lifting David, there's a really heavy payload that needs to be brought up by the balloons because they need to have cameras live streaming the whole thing. And each eight foot balloon only lifts about 15 pounds. The little balloons, the four foot ones, only lift about two pounds. So you need a lot of balloons. Plus, since the whole event will be live streamed, you need these big antennas to send a strong enough signal back down to Earth. So they decided to use circular antennas to keep it more compact. Also quite impressive was the fact that the whole crew was preparing this in like 100 degree weather. It was so hot there. Oh, also the balloons can't ascend too fast because otherwise they'll start to knock together and pop. So to keep the rate slow, they need to pop balloons. But David's not controlling that. It's the oldest form of aviation and I thought it was really simple yeah. and I'm finding to go so up is very simple, but to do a controlled up, yeah. it, it requires a lot more, 
uh, I've become a balloon expert. There's basically a mission control down on the ground and all these strings with little explosives attached to every single balloon so that mission control can pop them remotely. I thought that was a pretty creative idea. Anyways, I wish David the best of luck. At this point, he might have actually already jumped by the time this video comes out. It was so cool to get to watch the whole preparation process. I hope you learned something today because I definitely learned a lot making this video. Happy physicsing. Thank you.